In this recording, we're going to look at the mechanics of Parliament. In other words, the process that the legislature goes through in creating, repealing and uh, amending legislation. In earlier recordings, we'd looked at the institution of Parliament as a whole, how it's structured. This recording is really about what it does. We're going to go through the step-by-step lawmaking process and explain each of the key parts and how they relate to the subject. So, well, fundamentally, Parliament has three functions to do these three things, to repeal, to amend or create. The actual process itself is performed through the passing of legislation that can be creating new statutes or passing statutes that will either amend or repeal existing laws. Now, before embarking into an examination of these processes, it must be uh, restated that Parliament and the process of Parliament making laws is absolutely of fundamental importance to our system of governance. Why? Because the clearly expressed will of Parliament, which gets us legitimacy and authority through the people, will trump the actions of the other two arms of governments, the courts and the executive arm of governments. That's this concept of parliamentary supremacy and it underpins our entire system of law. That's not to say, however, that Parliament has unfettered, unlimited power to pass laws across all areas. Now, in earlier recordings, we may recall that the Federal Parliament, for example, only has the power to pass laws where it's given a head of power under Section 51 of the Australian Constitution. This idea that legislation, legislation itself can't trump the Constitution is implicit in our federal structure. And note that these constitutional requirements are uh, less strictly applied to the states themselves. So while they're subject to the Australian Constitution, that the, uh, the starting point for state governance is that provided legislation is done for the good governance of the people of that state, its uh, powers are unfettered. I must also note here that in some jurisdictions, the ACT and in Victoria, uh, there is a Bill of Rights and legislation has to be drafted and must be consistent with that Bill of Rights. This Bill of Rights uh, system or structure is not a feature of the federal government and it's not a feature in the state of Queensland. What Queensland does have, however, as I'll explain later in this recording, is a system of legislative standards and that when Queensland lawmakers uh, go to draft new bills and which eventually may be passed into law that that should be done with certain standards consistent with uh, human rights. Fundamentally though Parliament doesn't have the power to change the Constitution. That's not to say the Constitution can't be changed but the way it, it is to be changed is clearly mapped out in section 128 and it requires a referendum with a majority of people in the majority of states assenting to the particular changes. Now when thinking about the legislative process it's very helpful to remember that fundamentally the law and the creation of laws is a political process. So both the fact that it goes through Parliament, who are people elected on behalf of the people, and the fact that laws in terms of where the ideas come from, come from the people, citizens and pressure groups as well, is a really important um, part of it. Why? Because this is the arm of government that is most responsible to the people. So in terms of the cycle, these ideas are prepared in some sort of tangible form. Then they go through Cabinet. Cabinet being the small group of ministers who meet and discuss government policy. After going through Cabinet, uh, bills are then drafted. Then these bills go through the parliamentary process, through both Houses of Parliament and at the federal level. If it, the bill manages to survive this entire process, then it is sent to the Governor-General, signed off, and then comes into law at some stage, either on at that time or afterwards.
So looking at this first step of the process, when we think about where ideas for new laws come from, there are a wide variety of places. They can be through uh, government departments themselves, reflecting on laws that are either working or not working. They can be from special interest groups. They can come from academic, legal academic research. They can come from groups uh, particularly established to examine the law, law reform groups. They can be party policy, in other words, things that the parties have campaigned about. Or they can come from the MPs themselves, sometimes at the request of citizens who've petitioned their local M or uh, constituent party MPs. And again, it may be helpful to remember that this is an inherently political process. People want things. They want changes to be made and the mechanism for doing this is via the Parliament rather than the two other arms of government. So once an idea comes into fruition and is talked about in the public domain, the particular group trying to, um, to push towards having this enshrined in legislation will have to go and have a look to see how this equivalent law would actually work. You have to look at the cost, you'd have to look at the impact on other laws and regulations, we'd have to look at, at non-legislative alternatives and also to have a look at how similar laws work in other places, in other jurisdictions. Once this assessment uh, process has occurred, and assuming the thing is co coherent, then it can be put uh, before Cabinet for consideration. Now the next stage is one which is arguably the most political and is problematic because it's always carried out behind closed doors and that's the cabinet meeting. The uh, document or idea that's been drafted and the impact assessments that's been made is put before that group of people and often uh, opinion polls uh, are then considered and the Cabinet will consider how this particular piece of legislation fits overall with the party agenda and also whether they think themselves whether it's a particularly good idea. So it really can't be understated at this point that Cabinet and having these meetings is an incredibly important part of our parliamentary process and unfortunately is very opaque. The cartoon in the slide in front of you is a bit tongue-in-cheek um, with the North Korean cabinet meeting, really there is only one person, the, the leader. Whereas arguably in our system there is a lot more uh, debate amongst senior MPs who form cabinet in terms of whether particular um, policies can be achieved through legislation or not. So assuming that cabinet does assent to a particular uh, idea, that policy is then sent off to be drafted. This is done by the parliamentary drafting committee, either the federal or the state level. What that drafting process is, is the uh, act of creating a bill. A bill is something that's then processed through parliament and turned into a statute, into a piece of legislation known as an act. As part of doing this drafting process, the committee will also um, create explanatory notes explaining you know, what the purpose of this particular uh, bill is going to be and sort of notes that they've made throughout the drafting process. It's also important to note here that there are certain standards that have to be followed by these groups. They have their own um, set of policies. Now, importantly, in a place like Queensland, where there is no Bill of Rights, so to speak of, these legis legislative standards actually incorporate human rights. In other words, the parliamentary drafters are instructed that unless there is express intention on behalf of the potential lawmaker otherwise, all legislation is to be drafted consistent with human rights and the maintenance of those rights. So the first part of this thing, the bills themselves, these are essentially drafts of legislation. Now legislation can really exist in three modes, to create, to amend and to repeal. And in those latter two modes, when existing legislation is to be amendment, amended, then the bill itself will usually have the word amendment in it. With the idea being 
that the amendment bill is not really the important one. The amendment act's not the important one. It's the primary act or acts that can be many that are to be amended that are the things that will be referenced by the citizen and or the courts. This can be a little a tad tricky now to, under, to really to understand because when searching through legislation in either the Queensland or the federal system, when uh, a person, a law student, is, is looking for legislation, you'll find the most up-to-date version. And the reason for that is that the most up-to-date version will incorporate all of the amendments that have been done to that particular piece of legislation uh, after the point in time it was originally enacted. And this process of doing amendments can be very, very complex and some pieces of legislation, particularly things like social security, um, family law and taxation statutes, will get amended many, many, many times. It may be important to note at this juncture that the memorandums and the notes produced as part of the drafting process actually form an important uh, part of statutory interpretation because they're referred to as extrinsic materials and can be used as part of the process of interpreting the underlying legislation itself. Both at the federal level and in the Queensland system there's an Acts Interpretations Act and in those AIAs it's expressed that the dominant uh, approach in statutory interpretation is what's known as the purpose of approach. In other words, where there's ambiguity, the uh, interpreter of the legislation, usually the courts, is to look at the underlying purpose of that legislation in order to resolve that ambiguity. And as part of that process, the court, although not obliged to, may use extrinsic materials such as these memorandum and notes in order to either confirm what the ordinary meaning of the statute is, or to resolve ambiguity where some remains, or if an ordinary meaning would lead to an absurd or an unreasonable result, it can also draw upon that material. It must also be noted at this point that when reading um, these extrinsic materials, including the speeches of the minister, that the words of the minister itself is not always the same thing as the underlying will of Parliament. In other words, where, say, the Cabinet or the Minister herself or himself is expressing something using a certain language, that's not necessarily indicative of the entire Parliament's view on this particular uh, section in the legislation. Now, there are many theories about how legislation ought to be drafted. Uh, the example on the slide there is from uh, legal academic Sanford, who speaks of legislation as really embodying the ideals of law um, and that it's it should really fundamentally at its, at its core purpose be good for the people should improve people's lives um, now this is enshrined in many ways in uh, documents such as the Queensland Constitution where legislation ought to be drafted for the good governance of the people and in Queensland also, the legislative standards uh, legislation also says that legislation must be drafted to be consistent with human rights. And if Parliament wants to, in some ways, re remove these fundamental rights, then it has to be very, very clear throughout the entire process that that is what it intends to do. The process of drafting legislation can be seen as something of a balancing act. While there's a need to carefully map out the intent of Parliament and prescribe that uh, as precisely as possible, one can't be too prescriptive. If, for example, there are simply too many words, this, uh, in effect, can limit the power of the executive, um, uh, usually the statutory body, that it would actually administer that particular piece of legislation. Also, those who may have been exposed to statutory interpretation may have heard of the alleges and or the generale rule. The legis rule is really that um, a subsequent act will impliedly repeal an earlier one to the extent of any inconsistency. Uh, but an exception to legis is the generale rule that says, look, a later general rule won't necessarily uh, re uh, impliedly repeal an earlier very specific rule. So that 
where legislation is drafted and in a very narrow prescriptive way, um, this can sometimes have problems later on when Parliament uh, creates, um, I guess, broader legislation. Another difficulty with being too prescriptive is that things can be inconsistent. Where there are a lot of words in a statute, they can sometimes be inconsistent both with themselves and with other pieces of legislation. And finally, the more words you've got in a bill, the more likely there are to be errors. Now, the other side of this, of course, is if you have too few words, or the words are expressed in a very vague way, it's easier for people to find loopholes in those. Uh, also, vague, um, less prescribed legislation can be misread, both by the courts and by citizens. Also, the courts themselves, as part of this um, what we've described in earlier recordings, this, this I guess, activist approach. Um, part of our legal system is that we don't actually want to empower the courts to be needing to fill in the gaps all the time and using sort of common law rules and describing and mapping out new areas of law. We want to leave that to Parliament to carefully map these things out ahead of time. The other problem, of course, of being too vague and not having enough words in your bill is that it leads to uncertainty. People don't know what the law is and both citizens and markets respond to this. I'm going to talk now about the actual parliamentary process that we go through to turn a bill into an act. Now the first part is really to do with procedural matters, that idea of giving notice to the parliament that something is to be introduced. And make note that in Australia, things have to have already gone through cabinets. In other words, the government of the day would already have assented to the, um, to the main components of this, uh, of this bill ahead of time. And so that the person introducing the bill to the parliament, usually the minister uh, in charge of the relevant legislation, will introduce it and then do the first reading. After this first reading has happened, there is a second reading of the, uh, of the bill, and then it's debated in the parliament and analysed. After this parliamentary debate, it's put to a vote. Now again, the government of the day, in theory, will always have uh, enough numbers in order to pass this particular bill through the, the houses in, that it's introduced into, which usually is the lower house, but not always. After this vote, after the second reading, then goes to a series of parliamentary committees where each of the components of it are analysed in more depth and suggestions are made. And parliamentary committees are quite important in that it gives uh, the public can actually attend these things and listen and hear the process of people making submissions. And then this can happen over quite a long time. After it's come back from these committees, it goes to a third reading, and there is a final vote. Assuming that that vote succeeds, then the entire process is repeated in the other house. So for example, if we've just gone through this process in the lower house, in the House of Representatives, then this bill has to then go to the Senate, and they will repeat this same process and offer, in many cases, uh, suggestions for change. Assuming that this does happen, and it does make it through the other house, it's then sent off to the Governor-General in the Federal Parliament, or to the uh, Governor in the States, or the Administrator in the Territories, and that royal assent process is made. And at that point in time, the bill turns into an Act, and it comes into effect at a specified date. If there's no date specified, uh, it's for federal statutes, it's 28 days after royal assent. And for in the state of Queensland, it's on the day of royal assent. It should be noted that while in theory the Governor, Governor-General or Administrator can actually refuse to assent, in practice they very, very, very rarely do. It would have to be a very unusual situation in order for the Queen's representative to not affirm the creation of a law which has been done in accord to parliamentary process. Now so far we've considered the best case scenario when a, a bill that's presented to Parliament passes through it with flying colours without changes. However, that's pretty rare. It's not uncommon at all for committees to suggest changes to uh, bills. Now, 
these amendments, there's a process for doing that through the Parliament, and amendments themselves have to be suggested, um, presented to Parliament, and then uh, voted upon. This is something that uh, opposition uh, MPs can actually go through, and certainly uh, both sides of Parliament uh, participate in the committee stage. Usually amendments in this situation occur where there's some form of defect, an error, and something that uh, the drafters have overlooked as part of the drafting process, rather than a substantive change to the fundamental uh, sort of purpose or um, goals of the particular bill. If uh, either the committees or throughout the process it's discovered that there are actually some really substantial uh, defects, then the bill can be removed and there's a process for reintroducing it again after a period of time. If, however, in uh, systems where you've got the uh, two Houses of Parliament, there are different parties controlling those two, par par those two Houses, then things can be problematic. Why? Well, because legislation can be presented by the government of the day in the lower house, where they can be passed through because that government has a majority, but it can be blocked by the Senate. You may recall also that the um, people who make up the Senate are actually supposed to uphold the rights of states as well, and so that from time to time there may be a clash between the government of the day are controlling the lower house and often the independent MPs who are in the Senate and hold the balance of power there. So if the Senate rejects a bill that's been presented to it after going through the lower house, uh, it is sent back to the lower house and it can be re-presented to the Senate at some stage later. Now, if it is rejected for a second time, the Prime Minister may, sure he isn't obliged to, but um, may call for both Houses of Parliament to be dissolved and an election called. This process is known as a double dissolution of the Houses of Parliament. It occurs only rarely, although it did occur most recently in 2016, when both Houses were uh, dissolved as a result of uh, changes to the construction uh, industrial law which failed in the Senate twice. And also note that after such an election, if this same piece of legislation is put again to the Parliament, it can be done in what's called a joint sitting. That's where both the representatives from the Senate and from the House of Reps come together and they have one large vote where each, each uh, MP in that situation is considered to have one vote in order to resolve this deadlock. This is the same process, incidentally, as a joint sitting of Parliament that is required for the dismissal of a sitting judge. Now it may be important to note at this point that the parliamentary process in terms of introducing bills to the Parliament in Australia is largely done by the government. Why? Well, the government has the majority of seats in the House of Representatives, and as such, if bills are passed through that house, or tried to be passed through that house, that they don't like, it simply won't succeed. In other words, it's a fruitless endeavour. However, members who don't make up the government of the day still have an important role to play in our, um, in our parliament, in our legislative process. Firstly, they can sit on committees, committees being groups uh, appointed by parliament to consider legislation uh, section by section in much more depth than the Parliament can itself. Members of the Opposition can also submit private member bills. Now these are very, very, very rarely considered by the Government of the day in Australia. It's much more common in other uh, systems that follow the Westminster tradition, uh, the United Kingdom and New Zealand, where a ballot system is used so that bills that can be drafted by any MP and they're pulled out of a, of a ballot in order to, um, to be presented to the Parliament. Now again, something which is very contrary to the policy of the government of the day is very unlikely to succeed. One situation though where private members bills can succeed um, is when the Parliament has what's called a conscience vote. That is a specific type of vote which is endorsed by the government 
whereby members are not to vote on party lines. Instead, they're to vote um, essentially from their own conscience. Again, this is a very rare situation and will often occur on very controversial uh, issues um, such as uh, at the moment to do with gay marriage or on issues such as abortion or euthanasia. Things that are very controversial and very dangerous politically, often the government of the day will sort of wash themselves hands of an, uh, wash their hands of an issue, leave it up to the individual MPs on both sides of, sides of the House to vote on and to suffer, I guess, the political consequences of this um, themselves. Again, I do stress that this is actually quite rare in the Australian legal tradition. It's something that occurs a little bit more often, but not, um, it's not a huge part of the British, of the UK system, and in New Zealand. Another very important component of the legislative, in terms of the lawmaking um, process, is laws that they don't make. Now, this process known as delegated legislation is where Parliament passes a law in broad terms giving power to another body, usually a government ministry, to make um, sub-laws. Why do this? Well, Parliament simply does not have the time to map out every area of regulatory law that's required in order to, to run a um, society such as Australia. And so, by some estimates, the amount of delegated legislation outstrips um, actual parliamentary passed legislation about 10 to 1. Certainly, uh, bylaws that are passed by things like local governments are good examples of delegated legislation. The councils are given power under the Local Governments Act to make these laws, but they're usually given uh, limits and guidelines to those powers. So, for example, the local council in Townsville is given the power to um, establish areas of parking and to set and enforce fines upon those areas. But they're given a maximum amount that they can set for those fines. And so that's the limit of what that particular statutory body can do in terms of its power. And so a couple of things to note about delegated legislation. First of all, the Senate and the Federal Senate actually has the role of reviewing some of these delegated, um, uh, these delegated instruments that have been created by federal government departments. And because they're essentially decisions made by the executive under a particular statute, they are by default subject to administrative review. That is, they have to be made according to that statute. Otherwise, uh, a person whose rights are infringed can go to the courts and ask them to undo or overturn that. So in conclusion, the legislative process is complicated. And some questions to leave the listener with is, well, to actually think about why is this the case? Why is it so complex? And is there sufficient participation by members of the public? And are all of these processes subject to scrutiny, or are they done behind closed doors? And in particular, to think about the very, very political nature of our system, how parties work, and the role of cabinet in this process.